Some relationships are very colorful. Unlike the pale ones where there is only love or other relationships that are only hate, you have these colorful relationships that are both love and hate. You have some that are a little less dramatic. There's love, but there's also dislike. Or there is like, but there's a little lack of love. What causes this duality? What causes these shades within the relationship? Trying to find the source, getting to the root of it, we find in Hasidus that there is a strong emphasis on self-denial, on humility, on not taking yourself seriously at all. The ultimate question and the important question of who do you think you are? And why do you think you deserve? And as we say in the davening on Yom Kippur, I was nothing before I was born, I'm nothing now that I'm born, I'll be nothing after I die. A lot of self-examination and self-criticism and ultimately a transparency of self is desirable, is healthy, is holy. On the other hand, if we don't appreciate our lives, if we don't celebrate life, if we're not excited about every day of life and every moment of life, then that too is wrong. Hasidim are famous for their joy, the joy, the enthusiasm of life. So are we supposed to deprecate our lives? Are we supposed to think of ourselves as useless and meaningless and insignificant? Or are we supposed to celebrate every moment of life? And the answer very simply is both are true it depends on what we're talking about. In our existence, there is both being and living. I can be or I can live. If I focus on being, then I am going in the negative, ungodly direction. My being needs to be softened. My being needs to be humbled. My being needs to become transparent. Whereas life... Life is a gift. Life is divine. God says, choose life. That should be celebrated. And if I get that right, if I'm able to become transparent in my being, but enthusiastic about my living, then I am a mensch. And then, in my relationships with others, I have the proper balance as well. It's not what the other person can do for me, in my being, it's what the other person does for me for my life. If there is life in the relationship, then the relationship will be both loving and liking. But if my relationship feeds only my being because I take my being seriously, then we can have all sorts of distortions and all sorts of um, imbalances where I can like but not love, love but not like, love and hate, hate and love, and it becomes very messy. We talked about this at a lecture at the New Chabad House in uh, Minnetonka, a suburb of Minneapolis, and here's what it sounded like. Good evening, good evening. Thank you for coming out. Getting to like the people you love. Because there are times when we don't like the people we love. Maybe sometimes we don't love the people we like. But that's not so much of a problem. But when you don't like the people you love, that's a problem. To put it in different words, how to live with people you can't live without. So there are people in our lives that we can't live without, but we can't live with them either. That's a problem. That's a dilemma. Or, to put it in different words, relationships that are love-hate relationships. You love, but you don't love. You hate, but you can't hate, because you have to love. These kinds of relationships are the ones that uh, make up all the drama. That's what most of therapy is all about, marriage counseling, relationship training, all sorts of stuff would be a lot easier, of course, if we didn't love anybody. If you didn't really need anybody. You like somebody, you like him. You don't like him, you don't like him. What's the problem? 
take it or leave it. But it seems that relationships have an element or a side to them that are not negotiable. There are certain people in our lives who are not dispensable. And therefore, we have to deal with it. And we have to deal with it well in order to, in order to enjoy life, in order to be happy. Let's get a little Hasidic background on this so that we learn something even if we don't solve any problems. <laughs> That's one of the tricks of these lectures. At least you'll learn something even if it doesn't help your relationships. Hasidus gives us a definition. What is the definition of existence? What does existence mean? Obviously, there are two parts to being. One is the fact that we are, and the other is the life that we live. Because things can be without being alive. Of course, uh, everything has a certain amount of life, but we don't call it alive. Uh, stone doesn't deserve to be called alive, even though there's some life going on. If you examine it closely under a microscope and so on, there's, there is activity there. But it's not called a living being. Human beings are both existent and alive. And that's why we can speak about living or we can speak about being. The two parts of our existence. To be and to live are two different things. And the reason for that is because the properties the characteristics of life, of living, are different from the characteristics of being. So Hasidah says, for example, the miracle of the splitting of the sea, where water behaved like, like a wall, stood still like a wall. And Hasidah says that that was not the greatest miracle. The greatest miracle is the creation of the world. Why is the creation of the world a greater miracle than splitting the sea? Because what happened at the splitting of the sea is that the water changed its behavior, but its existence was not affected. Whereas in creation, there was nothing, and God said, let there be, and then it became. Which means its existence, its being, was altered from non, from negative, to positive, from non-being to being. How do we know that the water didn't lose its existence when it stopped flowing? The reasoning is very simple. There are many things that exist that don't flow, like trees. Trees exist, but they don't flow. So water exists, and it does flow. But if it didn't, then it would still exist just as everything else can exist without flowing. The same is true with fire. If fire was not hot, if the fire miraculously was cooled, like uh, Abraham, Avraham was thrown into the, into the furnace and it didn't burn him. That's a miracle. But the existence of the fire was not affected because many things exist that they don't, and don't burn, like water. So almost any characteristic we find in a given object is independent and separate from its existence. A thing can exist without flowing, without being hot, without being cold, without being big, without being small, without having its color, without having its shape. All of these things are in addition to the fact that it is. But then what is the fact? of existence and of being. What is the property? What is the characteristic of being? What defines that? The definition of being is that it takes up room. That's the definition. If something doesn't take up room, it does not exist. Even a thought takes up room. Not on a shelf but it takes up room in your mind because you can't think two thoughts at the same time, or not well. <laughs> you, can, you can think many thoughts at the same time, but they're not going to work. 
an emotion takes up space because you can't have two opposite emotions at the same time without going a little crazy because an emotion takes up emotional space. And what does it mean to take up space? It means very simply, it does not allow another existence to occupy the same space. That's the definition of being. Water can exist without flowing because it takes up space, whether it flows or not. Fire can exist without burning because it takes up space, whether it's hot or cold. And the same is true with all characteristics. So these characteristics, heat and cold, flowing, stationary, this is the life of the object. The existence and the being of the object is the fact that it takes up space. Now, is taking up space a positive thing or a negative thing? Heat can be very positive. Warmth. Cold can be very positive. Keeps things cool. Flowing can be a very positive thing. Being stationary, being firm, can also be very positive. But taking up space, what's positive about that? What's the virtue in taking up space? What's the virtue in the fact that you won't share your space? There is no virtue there. So here's the difference between being and living. Living has both positive and negative characteristics and qualities. Hot can be negative, but it can also be positive. Cool can be negative, it can also be positive. But being has no positive side. It takes up space, doesn't allow anything else to share that space, and that's the end of it. There's nothing positive. In our own existence, we have, of course, these two dimensions. I am and I live. I would be even if I didn't have any of the qualities of life because I would still take up space. So there's my existence and there's my living, my life. I think it might be a little bit simplistic but useful. What is depression? Depression means I am occupied or preoccupied with my being so my life doesn't function. I'm busy being. If my existence is threatened, not my life, my existence, if my existence is threatened, I become very protective, very defensive, very consumed by remaining in existence. I'm trying to survive. When I'm trying to survive, I can't live. When I'm busy surviving, my life is on hold. So, when a person wakes up in the morning, there are two possible feelings or moods, frame of mind that a person can be in. You wake up and you feel, I am, or you wake up and you feel, I'm alive. When you get up in the morning, it's back to, back to what? Back to being or back to living? We say maidani in the morning, first thing in the morning, immediately, because our first response, our primal, not only primary, but primal response should be to life and not to being. And so we say maidani, we are grateful to God and we acknowledge that God returned our soul to us. Not that we still are, because we were during the night as well. When you're asleep, you are. You take up room. When you wake up, your existence hasn't changed. Your life has changed. Because you went to sleep exhausted, and you wake up refreshed. That doesn't change your existence. That changes your life. So when you wake up in the morning, the first thing you have to react to and respond to is you're alive, not you are. The difference, of course, 
is that if you're alive, then you're buoyant, then you're <laughs> alive. If you exist, you're a dead weight. Because existence does only one thing. It takes up room. But it's not buoyant. It's heavy. It's burdensome. It drags you down. It weighs you down. And it certainly doesn't do anyone else very much good. Now, what happens in a relationship? If I'm feeling my own being, I am, then my life is a burden. I'm depressed. Anything I need to do is too hard. Too much of a bother. Because a lifeless being is not in the mood of doing anything. Now you come along and you want to have a relationship with me. <laughs> Sorry. You're a burden. No matter what you say, no matter what you do, you're a burden. In fact... Torah refers to marriage as a burden. A man gets married, what happens? According to the Gemara, when you get married, you take upon yourself the millstone. That's heavy. Once you're married, you have a millstone around your neck. You are burdened. Now, is that a nice way to describe a relationship? The Gemara is talking about your existence. How has your existence changed when you get married? We're not talking about life. We're talking about being. Before you got married, your existence was without this additional yoke. Now that you're married, you have an additional yoke. So if life was heavy before, it's twice as heavy now. There's no way around it. Question is, why would anybody do this? Who needs this, right? I don't need this. To compensate for that, a relationship also has a life of its own. So that when you get married, when you're in a relationship, you had a life before, you now have a life after. What changed in your life? What is different in your life from before the relationship to after the relationship? Well, obviously, two lives are much more alive than one. In fact, two lives are much more alive than two lives separately. And that's why when two become one, it ends up being three with the baby or four, or 14. <laughs> because where you have two, you have a lot of life. Much more than just two lives combined. And that is supposed to make up, and more than make up, for the additional yoke on your existence. Basically what I'm saying is this. When we're alone, we have to balance our existence with our life. Being with living. Being drags you down, living buoys you up. I mean, for the scientists, even in the atom, you have the part that weighs it down, the dead weight, and then you have the electron or the photon or whatever it is that is full of energy and makes it all worthwhile. So in the balance of my being and of my living, I have to give prominence to life over existence. When I get married, I have to do that ten times more. Because if in my self-perception, I think of myself as being, and I feel my being, then the relationship can't go anywhere. And here's where, possibly, the love-hate relationships come in. There are times when 
your being in my life, well, your being in my universe, enhances my existence, but it does very little for my life. I was wondering about this. We just read Parsha Bereshis. God said, it is not good for man alone to exist. What's not good about it? If you look in Rashi, Rashi makes a very interesting comment. We all assume it's not good that man alone exists means that man is not so good by himself. He can't feed himself. He can't clean up after himself. He needs a wife. Rashi says something completely different. It's not loneliness. It's not helplessness that man needs a wife for. It is not good that man exists alone is because if he existed alone, he would get the impression that he was God. In other words, it would be too good. <laughs> he, would, he would think he's God because God is unique and alone in heaven and man is unique and alone on earth. So to correct that, God said, no, no, can't be alone. You might get the wrong impression. <laughs> I will give you a helpmate who will humble you <laughs> and remind you how, uh, how mortal you are and how little of a god you are. Right? But look at what the words themselves are saying. It doesn't say it's not good for man to live alone. It says it's not good for man to be alone. It's his being, not his life. In fact, if we think about it, a person living alone is more alive in some sense. We don't need another person to live. If we have a project, if we're busy with something, we don't need anybody else. Give me a mission, give me a job, I'm busy. Somebody else will only distract me, will only get in the way. So really, why do I need another being in my life? Because it's not good to be alone. It's the being. Now, there are many people who, by, by personality, by, by nature, they don't want a relationship. They want a somebody. They don't want to talk to you, but don't go away. They complain. I'm sure you're on it. People complain, how come you're never home? In marriage counseling. The wife says, he's never home. I said, why aren't you ever home? He said, why should I be home? When I'm home, she ignores me. I said, you ignore him? He said, well, I'm busy. I said, so <laughs> what do you care if he's home or not? We need somebody just to be there so that we're not alone. And what do you want to do with this somebody? Nothing. I'm busy. I got what to do. I've got a life. Leave me alone. Okay, so I'm leaving. No, don't leave. Oh, don't go very far. <laughs> like, what, what is that? It means I need you to enhance my being, but I don't need you in my life. I think we've talked about this once before. Somebody can be the love of your life, but they're not the pleasure of your life. It's possible. Your pleasure comes from whatever it is you enjoy. But the love of your life is your spouse. And sometimes it can be the opposite. Your spouse is the pleasure in your life, but the love of your life is something else. To have your spouse be your love and your pleasure, that's too much. <laughs> that's a fixation. I mean, that's like uh, too close. And that's why it's a helpmate against you need a little distance. You need a little something else in your existence besides just the spouse. So you've got to bring pleasure to the relationship, at least for the man. A man doesn't feel right if he simply he has a wife. She is the love of his life. She is the pleasure of his life, and that's it. That's good when you're 80, 85. <laughs> But until that time, you feel a need to, you've got to bring home the, uh, what's the expression? You've got to bring home the, the bread. <laughs> because that's your role. You're supposed to 
bring pleasure to the relationship from outside the relationship. But these are the two parts to our existence. So there are times when I need you to be there, not because of my life, which is fine without you, but I need you to be there because being alone is not good. So even if I don't like you, don't go away. And you have people who fight all their lives. And every other week, it's like, okay, that's it. It's over. But it's never over. Why? Because although they're irritating each other's lives, they're necessary for each other's being. And that's valid. That's true. The problem is that when somebody enhances your being, they deserve to be loved. So if you can't live without them, then they deserve to be part of your life. There are people who are the exact opposite. They want you in their life because you enhance their life. But they don't need you for their being. So as long as you're enhancing their life and things are exciting and you're doing things and you're growing, and then it's fine. If not, I don't need you. And sometimes you see people who loved each other for a long time and they really had a good life together, but when that was over, they parted so easily, painlessly. It's like, okay, nice knowing you. That's it, it's over. Where's the agony? Where's the, 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 the gut-wrenching divorce trauma? <laughs> gone is gone. Because they didn't need you for their being. They only needed you for their life. And you're not enhancing their life anymore, so life goes on. The trick is to find a balance. If you love somebody but don't like them, or like them but don't love them, I mean, the words are really not important. The point of it is there is someone in your life who needs to be there. You need them there. And yet, the relationship is not completed. It's only good for your being, but it's not enhancing your life. Or it's good for your life, but not important to your being. You've got to balance that. And then you don't have a person you love and hate. Or love but don't like. Or need but don't care for. Or care for but don't need. So these are the two sides. A relationship is a burden. Absolutely. Why is it a burden? Because you are a burden. Your existence, your being, is by its very nature burdensome. When you bring another being into your universe, now you've got two dead weights, two beings who take up room. That's a burden. And it's a burden we accept. It's a burden we Welcome, because it's not good to be alone. Then there's the other side. There's life. What is life? What is your life all about? When you bring another person into your life, and they too, the spouse, has a life. When you bring two lives together, then you become buoyant enough to carry the weight of the relationship. So if there's a problem, the first thing we have to do is identify which area is troubled. Is it that you can't carry the weight? Or is it that you don't have a compatible life energy? Is it in your life area that the problem is? Or is it in your being? And you can see the difference when a couple are having problems. You can see the difference immediately. They come for counseling. Do they have this dead look in their eyes? Because this is just burdened beyond bearing. Or is there fire in their eyes? Because they're determined to live and something is not working. They're busy living, but there's conflict. Or So if it's a living relationship that is in conflict, 
then it needs a little adjustment, and the two lives can be great. If it's a deadening, burdening thing, then you need to introduce a little lightness into the relationship. Now, why would there be a problem? Torah tells us two things. Number one, life is wonderful. Life is always wonderful. Ubacharta bachayim, choose life. Life is always good. When do we need to be told to choose life? When you're having a great time? If we need to be told from heaven, divine, <laughs> divine wisdom, when you have a choice, choose life. When do you have a choice? When would you be confused, not know which one to choose? Life or the opposite of life? When is that? Obviously, when things are very painful, very painful. So Torah says, even when things are very, very painful, and there seems to be uh, a choice, you could go either way. Don't be confused. Life is wonderful. Choose life. Even then. There's that song of Fiddler on the Roof. Uh, God wants us to be happy even, while, even when our hearts lay panting on the floor. What is there to be happy about? If your heart lays panting on the floor, because life is good, always. That's on, on the one hand. On the other hand, being is a curse. Being. The Gemara says we, we're better off not being. It's easier not to be. Being is a burden. It's a weight. Therefore, we should focus on the fact that our being is invalid. We have no right to be. We were nothing. I mean, you know, the whole, the whole text of the davening on Yom Kippur. I was nothing before I was created. I'm nothing now. I'll go back to the dust. I'll be nothing there. What is my existence anyway? Uh, you end up with feeding the worms. I mean, really negative, depressing stuff. But that's an accurate description of being. A person who takes his being seriously is arrogant. It's idolatrous. It's equal to worshiping idols. Because what is an idol? An idol is something that is basically invalid, but you imbue it with all sorts of importance. That's our being. My being is negative. It's ungodly. It's in contradiction to God. God is. And if I feel that I am, then I got Adam's problem. I think God is God in heaven and I'm God on earth. Why? Because I am. Emming is not good. <laughs> it's not good to em. And that's why all of Torah, all the wisdom of Torah is, you're nothing. Don't take yourself seriously. You're nothing. From dust to dust, that's all. It's nothing. There's that famous Golda Meir statement. Don't be so humble. You're not that important. <laughs> I mean, even being humble about your existence is already giving yourself too much importance. When a person says, nah, I'm not important. You were not important enough to say that. Your existence is not important enough to be denied. You know it's like, you know, who's, Nixon said, I'm not a crook. Now, why did he have to say that? If you're not a crook, you don't say it. <laughs> so if you say, I'm not important, who needs to say that? Only somebody important. So we're not important enough to even denigrate our being. And as soon as we start to feel a little significance, well, what about me? This is deadly stuff. It's deadly stuff. It's burdensome. It's dead weight. It's poison to our own life and certainly to the life of a relationship. So the two sides of life, according to Torah... Your existence is ungodly, unholy, and idolatrous. 
Your life is divine. In other words, your existence contradicts God, but your life satisfies God. That's why he created you. He created you to get past your existence and live in the way that satisfies his need. So life is divine, being is evil. So when, pers- when, when you're asked the question, are human beings good or bad? Depends what you're talking about. If you're talking about our existence, the fact that we be, that's bad. That's bad. It just takes up room. It just denies everybody and everything else. That's all it does. And that's why it's so bad to be alone. Because then it gets even worse. A person who cannot tolerate another being in their environment, that's horrendous. That we have to soften. That we have to uh, deny Eliminate as much as possible from our thinking. I am. Now, when uh, the Shabbos of your birthday, you have to get called up to the Torah. That's our custom. Hani, my wife's grandfather, was a very sharp, a very bright, very sharp chassid who was in charge of giving out the, uh, the aliyahs. A young man once came to him and said, with great excitement, Rabbi, Rabbi, I need an aliyah. And he said, why? What's the matter? What do you need an aliyah? Sounded too important, self-important. He said, it's my birthday. And Hani's grandfather said, oh, you were born? Well, sit and cry. (laughs) That's terrible. That's very bad. But what is this? Oh, for that you need an aliyah? No, for that you should sit and cry. It's like, oh, I am, I am. Yeah, well, that's too bad. That's really sad. You have to, you have to you know, find a way to fix that. <laughs> and on the other hand, if you're sad, according to Hasidus, oh, that's, that's the biggest sin. It's not written anywhere, but it's the biggest sin. Sadness? Because if you're not excited about life, then you're denying yourself godliness. But if you are excited about your being, <laughs> then your being denies godliness. This is our balance. This is how a relationship can work. I mean, a relationship can only work if the two people in the relationship are working, are functional. How are people functional? Sit and cry over the fact that you are and find great joy in the fact that you're alive. Then you're a mensch. Then you're a mensch. If you only enjoy the fact that you're alive, you will not accept burden. And then you can't have a relationship. If you're accepting of burden, but you're not thrilled with life, you'll survive. You'll live to a ripe old age, but nobody's going to enjoy your company. Balance the two. Don't take your being seriously, but take life very seriously. How does that work? If I take my being seriously, everything annoys me, even physically. Even physically. Pollen will wipe me out. A little dust, a little mold, a little this, a little that. Any little thing will wipe me out if I'm focused on being, because that's a burden enough. Add to that a little allergen, that's it, I'm wiped out. Any annoyance, that's it, finished. If I don't take my being so seriously, so put a little weight on me, it's all right. I can carry it. Life is a burden, I know that. On the other hand, If you think life is only part of your being and there's nothing more to life than you, life is sacred. A person can be 
without living. So why does God give us life in addition to our being? It's a divine gift. That's what the Modani is all about. You wake up in the morning and you say, I am, I have been all night, but now I have my soul back. Now God gives me a life to live. It's not about me. This life is not me. It's a gift that I lose to some degree every night. And I get it back every morning. So seeing life as divine and myself as a burden, that's a good balance. That's a good balance. If you're going to criticize yourself, criticize your being, don't find fault with your life. Life is always good. What do you do for your spouse? Number one, your spouse has a being and that's heavy for her or for him. Your first job, unburden by taking some of the burden. Unburden your spouse's being because being is burdensome. Any little thing you can do, any silly little thing you can do that unburdens, that's good. Because as I said before, any little burden can wipe a person out. So any little burden you take away is a big favor, big mitzvah. So the little irritations that a spouse has, you have to take that very seriously. That's responsibility number one. Make it your burden. <coughs> Unburden your spouse. Then responsibility number two is bring more life to your spouse's life. And that means purpose, enjoyment, joy. That's life stuff. So unburden in the little ways that life is burdened and bring joy and purpose and direction and meaning to life. When you're busy doing that, there's no way a relationship can be bad. There's no way you cannot like what is your life. There's no way that you can love and hate the person who shares your burden and increases your life. Studies have shown married people live longer and are less likely to be depressed. Isn't that surprising? <laughs> Contrary to public opinion, it turns out that being married lengthens your life and keeps you from being depressed. It lengthens your life because your spouse takes some of your burden. And it keeps you from being depressed because it increases the life of your life, the livelihood of your life. Now, does any of this make sense yet, so far? Okay, so let's get practical. There's someone you love but you don't like. What should you do? Step number one. Look at yourself and ask yourself, where is my focus? It's possible that you love this person, but the little extra burden is too much for you. Why would that be? Because you're too focused on your being. The burden part in your own life is too big. And that's why a little bit of burden added by the spouse you don't like. You can't like it. You can't enjoy it. It's too burdensome. I just tell the story. You know, the first child you have, the first baby, you take thousands of pictures. So when Yossi was born, our first, we had the photographer over within weeks. You know, professional photographer. This guy came, he's a young man, and he's setting up and he's doing his thing there. And he says, so how long are you married? And then we asked him whether he was married. He said, was. 
He didn't look to be more than 24. I said, was? That was, that was fast. <laughs> what happened? He said, nah, it, it wasn't for me. I wanted the window open. She wanted it closed. Eh, it wasn't for me. <laughs> and we looked at each other like, this is, this is what people get divorced over? The window? Anyway, he left, and we were like in shock. We were talking about it. What is this? This is crazy. The guy's obviously not all there. He got divorced because the window was open or closed. And, and not like after 10 years of an open window. He, what, was he married for a year? But then when you stop and think about it, why not? Why not? You like the window open. She closes it. Call it off. <laughs> you know, what do you need this for? What are you going to spend the rest of your life arguing and fighting with her about? Forget it. Call it off. Because if your life is basically burdened, what do you need? More burden? That's it. Call it off. But why is your life so burdened that another little annoyance and it's all over. That's because you've already burdened yourself with your own existence. Now somebody comes along and annoys you? <laughs> That's the last thing you need. Run away. Save your life. But that's because you're too burdened to begin with. And maybe there should be some kind of a law. Maybe there should be some kind of a test. Before you can get married, you have to have a stress test. <laughs> you know? If you're already stressed up to a certain level, forget it. You can't marry. Because there's going to be a little more stress and it, you can't handle it. So before you get married and take on a little stress, you have to be flexible in your own existence. Not on the verge of cracking. So if little things are annoying you, and you can't get comfortable with it, and that's why you don't like the person you love, open up the text of the Yom Kippur davening and read it again. <laughs> I'm nothing, I was never anything, I'm going to end up being nothing. Go, go over that again. It'll help you relax. <laughs> Your being will soften a little bit. And then you'll be able to tolerate a little annoyance. If, on the other hand, you are fine with the person you're with, but you don't love them. No complaints. Everything's good. Don't want them to leave. But love them? Mm. Then the problem is in the other half. Your existence is fine. Your uh, being is okay. You're not overly arrogant. You're not overly consumed by the fact that you are. You've davened well. <laughs> You've gotten the message. And you're willing to put up with annoyance, with burden, with... But love, no. Why? Because you don't see the sanctity of life. You're sharing a life with this person. How can you not love them? It's because you don't find life that precious. Your life is not that precious. So the fact that somebody is sharing your life, oh, that's fine. So what? So then you have to focus on the other half of life. Life is a gift, a divine gift. Life is on loan because God wants it back and he wants it back in good shape. And he's giving it to you because he trusts you to make something with it, to cherish it, to get up excited in the morning that you have life, to be grateful, to say thank you. And if somebody shares it with you, how can you not love them? You love life, you naturally love the person who is sharing your life. If we're talking about parents, if you love life, how can you not love the one who gave you life? So before we start attacking each other, 
You're the reason I'm not happy. You're making me miserable. We first have to examine our own balance, our own orientation to our own existence. If you're not thrilled by your life, then you're sinning. And if you are impressed with the fact that you are, then you're sinning. So let's get it straight. The thou shalt and the thou shalt not. Thou shalt not have other gods means lighten up. You're not that important. <laughs> and I am God, your God, who took you out of Egypt means what? You don't, you don't appreciate? You're not thrilled? It's not right. And if we fulfill those first two commandments, we're in good shape. We're in good shape because they represent the whole Torah. You fulfill those two commandments, you've basically, in essence, have fulfilled the whole Torah. And that's why those two commandments God said himself directly to the people. The other eight commandments God said to Moshe and the people heard. But it wasn't addressed to them. So can we do this? I mean, it's a new year. We've got new potential. We can start fresh. And we can do things we haven't done before and not feel so awkward, like, oh, all of a sudden, look at him. Yeah, it's a new year. A new year, you do new things. Awkwardly at first, but it works. Here's one final quote. We said in the davening many times, Rosh Hashanah, Yom Kippur, in that special prayer when we open up the ark and everybody stands and we repeat after the chazan. And one of the things that we ask of God is, Shema Keleinu, hear our, our pleas, hear our voice, and so on. And then we say, Do not reject us, Al Tashlichenu Milfanecha, do not reject us, Veruach Kochecha Al Tikach Mimenu. And your Holy Spirit don't take away from us. Now, Holy Spirit usually means prophecy. Why are we praying not to lose our prophecy? We never had it. So what does this prayer mean? Don't take away our prophecy. We're not prophets. We never had this Holy Spirit. So what are we worried about? So Hasidus explains, Holy Spirit doesn't mean prophecy. Holy Spirit means that which once inspired us, that's Holy Spirit. And we've all had something that inspired us. For each person, it was something different. But something inspired you, otherwise you wouldn't be here tonight. Now, over time, that which inspired us the most can fade. Hard to believe, but it can happen. If it inspired you, if it changed your life, how would you ever forget? But we manage. <laughs> we manage to forget even the things that changed our lives for the better, that inspired us, that was our Ruach HaKadosh, the Holy Spirit. And that's why every year we have to pray that we don't lose it, that it's not taken away. That which once inspired us should continue to inspire us. And we have to pay attention and renew it. So for the new year, if we focus on what once inspired you, whether it was in the marriage or in Judaism or just in life itself, get it back. Refresh it. Use it again. You know, it's not like a match <laughs> that works once and then never works again. If it worked once, it will work again. Use it to inspire yourself again. Only this time, more mature, more advanced, more meaningful, but alive. So, Ruach Kotshech Al Tikach Mimeni. Don't lose that Holy Spirit. Don't lose that Holy Spark. Keep using it, and it'll serve you. It's a gift that you have to keep for a lifetime. Find it again and be inspired again. Life can be good.
even when your heart lies panting on the floor. So what do you think? You said go back and reread Yom Kippur and I am nothing. I mean, if you think you're not nothing, then how do you convince yourself that you are? <laughs> Here's the thing. If you don't convince yourself you're nothing, somebody else will. <laughs> The trick is not to wait. <laughs> Get there first. So that when your wife or, or your employer or somebody says, you're nothing, you can be able to say, I know that. See, then it doesn't hurt as much. <laughs> I think God provides events or people or something that will let us know that we're nothing. But that's painful. It's much better when we do it ourselves. So... If we just think back, there are plenty of proofs and indications of our nothingness. But even if, there are, even if there isn't, it's unwise, it's simply bad judgment to take my being more seriously than my life. It's just, it's just bad judgment. Life is so much more than being. Why would I choose being over life? It's bad judgment. And the truth is that they are in conflict. If I feel my being, I don't enjoy life as much. If I enjoy life, I forget about my being. A very simple example. When you're bored because nothing exciting is going on in your life, you never forget that you're hungry. You're hungry even when you're not hungry. But when you're doing something exciting and life is exciting, you forget you're hungry. You forget to eat. Eating is part of being. If you're doing something exciting to where you forget that you haven't eaten, then obviously your life has outpaced your being, and that's good. But for a person to say, yeah, maybe it would be exciting to go, but I got to eat. What are you doing? Why would anybody do that? That's bad judgment. That's just a poor choice. It's always a choice. How do people survive terrible circumstances? People in concentration camps, people in, in Russian prisons. How do they survive? By giving up on survival and getting busy with life. Those who tried desperately to survive didn't. They cracked. Those who said, look, you know, I may not survive. Yeah, that's the way it goes. But it's time to daven mencha. They survived. I mean, I, don't, I haven't read his whole book, but Sharansky survived because he didn't think he was going to survive. He just wanted to see his wife again. It wasn't about survival. He was married for one week. There was a wife out there somewhere. So, I mean, it's not the most uh, divine of uh, purposes in life, but he was busy living, and that's why he survived. If he got busy surviving, he probably wouldn't have. How do you address a uh, person that uh, is codependent? They can't seem to live without their husband or wife or their mate, uh, or I need you, I can't live without you. Total dependency. How do you address that type of thing? Well, psychologically, medically, uh, in terms of mental health, that's a problem. Aside from that, it's no problem. <laughs> that's what I wanted you to. That's what I wanted you to say. Yeah, it's like I need her desperately, right? And you're married to her. Yeah. Well, then what's your problem? <laughs> I can't live without her, and you're living with her, right? Well, so what's your problem? So what's the problem? <laughs> Too much of a good thing? Question is, you know, are you getting on her nerves? <laughs> are you not letting her breathe? Are you choking her? Maybe because you're afraid that your dependency is unhealthy. Maybe once you decide, yes, I'm dependent, and no, I can't live without her, and that's the way it is, maybe you'll stop choking her. <laughs> So maybe, maybe the solution is to get comfortable with the dependency and say, this is a nice thing. I desperately needed somebody, and I found that somebody. 
What could be better? So relax. Be dependent, gesund der Heit. And enjoy it. Codependent. Co Does that sound so bad? <laughs> no, it sounds wonderful. It sounds wonderful if, if you're both agreeable. So if two people agree to be codependent, what the chutzpah of a psychiatrist to come along and say, no, you can't. <laughs> this is sick. <laughs> Mind your own business. Adam and Eve were codependent. In fact, they were Siamese twins. And everything was fine. But then God separated them, and look what happened. <laughs> So maybe being codependent is better. As long as you're not choking each other. You said um, existence is ungodly, um, but doesn't God exist and isn't he the essence of existence? Yes, and that's why our existence is ungodly. Because God's existence is true and exclusive, and our existence is a little bit of a lie. It's like saying, what's wrong with feeling important? Isn't God important? Yes, God is really important, and you're not. That's why it's wrong. <laughs> so you say, why can't I get angry? God gets angry. That's exactly why you can't. It's a divine thing, and you're not divine. You're playing God, and that's not nice. So yes, God does that. That's why you can't. God gave Ten Commandments. Why can't I? <laughs> what is that? <laughs> <laughs> 